Hi Chem students, we're going to talk about spontaneity and how finding a, a new term of energy, a new type of energy, the Gibbs free energy, will help us predict which way a, a reaction will move uh, and it'll, it'll be a lot easier than trying to do so with a whole bunch of different variables. So let's see how that all fits together. So let's start by introducing this whole idea of what's called the Gibbs free energy and what we know is this. Here's what we figured out. A system that's at constant temperature and pressure there are some things that determine its spontaneity, but it's not just the enthalpy change and it's not just the entropy change. It's actually a combination of both of these things that play a role. We saw that that delta H minus T delta S, if we knew that, if we could do that math, we would end up with a way to predict whether something was going to happen spontaneously or not. So here's what we're talking about. Well, you know what? We also saw one other thing earlier on in our, in our studies of thermodynamics, and that is the enthalpy was defined in terms of the internal energy and the work energy that was involved with some kind of process. And it was very, it was just done for a convenience. There was no other reason other than to say, you know what? If we just have this one number, it's, it's, it's a better thing to play with. We just have to concentrate on one thing, not E plus PV. Well, let's do the same thing. Gibbs did this with, um, with energy and what he did is he said oh let's let's take what we had before e plus pv but let's also take into account that this object the system is interacting with the surroundings thermally with thermal energy that's the temperature times the entropy so what we've got is an energy that's the internal energy of the of the object itself or the system itself minus the work that the system is doing minus any thermal energy it's got by interacting with the surroundings so that's what we have here but if we recall, E plus PV, just above here, we can see that we define that as enthalpy. So what we have for us now is a way, we have this G is equal to H minus TS. And if we take and look at the change in G, how can this new thing, Gibbs free energy, that's what G is, how can it change? Well, it can change because the enthalpy changes. So it can change because the enthalpy changes or the entropy changes or the temperature changes. But if you remember, we've been playing around with constant temperature. That's what we've said. Constant temperature and pressure is what we're playing with. Therefore, that delta T would be equal to zero. And we get a nice simple relationship that says delta G, the Gibbs free energy change of some system, is equal to the enthalpy change of the system minus the temperature times the entropy change of the system. Well, if that's the case, then I can just substitute that in. We've got one variable that tells us the same story as the other two variables did, that's a lot easier to handle. And now we can substitute it in and we see that it tells us the exact same thing. If the change in the Gibbs free energy is less than zero, a process is spontaneous. If it's equal to zero, then the process is at equilibrium. That's pretty great. So if we have a reaction and we know what delta G is, we can tell you what it's doing, whether it's shifting from left to right to reach products, whether it's moving spontaneously as written, whether it's at equilibrium because delta G is equal to zero, and then finally, whether or not uh, it's moving in the opposite direction of what it should because delta G is greater than zero. So let's talk about the Gibbs free energy just a little bit more, all right? And so remember, we're talking about systems that are at constant temperature and pressure, and it appears because the delta G is going to be trying to is, is, is going to be negative. The change is negative. That means the value of the Gibbs free energy is constantly getting smaller until we reach equilibrium. So in other words, a system moves towards equilibrium in an attempt to minimize its Gibbs free energy. Fantastic. We also see that exothermic reactions help reduce delta, help reduce G because exothermic reactions have a negative delta H. And since we're, since it has delta H minus T delta S, if that first term is negative, that's a, a good thing for us in terms of trying to see if it's spontaneous. We also see that if we can spread the energy out better, if we have a larger entropy, that also helps to reduce the Gibbs free energy. All right, here's an example real quick of just how you would play around with this equation that we just saw. And that is what if we had an enthalpy change of minus 100, negative 100 kilojoules, and an entropy change of minus 1,000 joules per Kelvin, and we're, and we're at three, 300 Kelvin. The question is, will the reaction proceed spontaneously under these conditions? So we just plug it in. Minus 100 kilojoules, minus 300 K, 
or I'm sorry, 300K and then minus 1,000 joules per Kelvin. And here's an important note for you. This is why we keep units and we always put units on every single number, even when we're doing the calculations, so that we can see. Check it out. This is in joules per Kelvin, and we have kilojoules over here. Remember the old saying, you, have to, you can add apples and apples, but not apples and oranges? That's what we're talking about here. We have to have the exact same noun, the, sa the exact same unit, kilojoules and kilojoules, or joules and joules. So I've converted my joules to kilojoules right here with my conversion factors. You see the joules will cancel out, and I'll be left with kilojoules per Kelvin. Now, when I multiply by the Kelvin, I'm left with kilojoules, and I end up with a positive 200 kilojoules for this process. What that tells me is the way that I've written down this process to go from start to end, I get a positive delta G. It's not going to proceed in the direction I've written it because it's not spontaneous in that direction. It's possible that it could proceed in the opposite direction because that process is spontaneous because if we flip, reverse the reaction, all of these numbers will change. We'd have a positive 100. We'd have a positive 1,000 if we were to reverse the process. So, how we write a process is very important, and I'd like you to be very specific because the textbooks tend to not do this properly. They tend to say, oh, the process is not spontaneous. I don't know that. All I know is it's not spontaneous in the way it is written. It might be spontaneous in the opposite direction. Keep that in mind. It's a very important thing. All right. Uh, let's connect the dots a little bit. Most people remove the cis from the subscripts and we just write delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. Not a big deal, right? Uh, since G is uh, a state function, it's composed of state functions, I'm sorry, then it is also a state function. That means we can do calculations just like you'd see for Hess's law type of computations. Ah, we already know how to do those, so that's excellent. And under standard conditions then, there might be a relationship between all the standard versions of these. Remember standard conditions? We'll talk about what those are in a second, but whenever you see the word standard, you need to add in the little naught. That's, that's, the, signa that's the signal that, hey, this is not just any old conditions, it's standard conditions. And there's tables of these that you can have. Uh, they're in the back of your book. I, I handed one out in class of Gibbs free energy. The, and normally we get these in terms of formations, um, but you can get them in lots of different variations. We will stick with the entropy, the enthalpy, and the Gibbs free energy of formation tables. Once again, I want to reiterate what, what we mean by standard conditions. Standard conditions are one atmosphere for any gas, one molar for every solution that's in there. So uh, let's get a pictorial version of this because I think it might help out. So we've got some reaction, A plus B is in equilibrium with C. And A is some kind of gaseous substance and B and C are, are, are in solution. And so obviously at the interface where the gas molecules of A collide with the surface, they're part of this reaction. And we end up with this equilibrium of some A molecules floating around above. Uh, there's probably some water as well because water is going to, at this temperature, probably going to have a little bit of evaporation going on. Okay, so if we look at the standard conditions, everything's at one atmosphere, one atmosphere, one atmosphere. This is a very specific set of initial conditions for us to run the reaction. So what we could do is if we ran this and we could measure the Gibbs free energy, then we could put that in the back of the book and everyone would know, A, what the conditions that we started the reaction were, and B, what that Gibbs free energy is. And so that would be a delta G naught, and we'd put that in the back of a book. What about non-standard conditions? Well, there's as many non-standard conditions as you can imagine. We could start off with none of the reactant A, but some of our other pieces. And this process would move backwards. As you can just take a look at it from Le Chatelier's principle. This is going to shift to the left to get to an equilibrium. Look at this reaction here. We've got no product. That's how we often think of reactions, is starting with just reactants. That's how we do it in the lab. But in nature, sometimes the chemicals are there, and then finally the last reactant or the last product is introduced to make it all happen. And finally, uh, we could look at another version where we just got some random numbers. There's an infinite number of varieties of non-standard conditions, and that's why we don't put them in the back of the book, just standard conditions. So the ones on the left, these would have the little nod on them, these guys over here on the right, non-standard conditions, would just be a regular old delta G, delta H, and delta S. All right.
So before you come into class, it would be great if you were to think about these questions right here. Using the table of Gibbs free energy formation data that you have, can you find what the energy of vaporization of water is, the free energy of, of vaporization of water is? And then ask yourself, does this number make sense to me? Try to interpret what the number means. All right. Hey, how about this? If I have a reaction at constant TMP and it's exothermic, is that always spontaneous? So if you say yes, show me why it's yes. And if it, you say no, tell me why it's no. Then finally, when a reaction's at equilibrium, how is the Gibbs free energy changing? So how is G changing when we reach, uh, when we have uh, something that's at equilibrium? So there you go. Give these a try before you come to class. We'll talk about them right at the very beginning. And uh, then you'll do some other problems on your own to see if you've got entropy and the second law and Gibbs free energy down.